so good to be in the house of the Lord with all of you this morning. And uh, man, I felt the love of Jesus in this place. Praise God. We're in, we're in a series called Power Supply. October is a month where we're highlighting missions. We've been reminded each and every week that 3.2 billion people live in the world and are lost. <laughs> and if they don't receive the news and do something with the news that Jesus Christ came and died for their sin, was raised from the dead victoriously, proving that he was the son of God, and if they do not receive the great gift of grace as you and I have, then unfortunately they will be separated from God for all of eternity. But it ought not be that way because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God takes no joy in the death of the wicked. It's his desire that all would come to know his great love and receive his great grace. Amen? Amen. We're going to break ground in chapter 5 of Acts this morning. And so if you would turn with me there, we're going to begin reading verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself a part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it then that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to man, but you've lied to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young, man, the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church, upon all who heard these things. Now this passage tells the story of Ananias and Sapphira, if you've been in the church for any length of time, you've most likely heard about these two people, this husband and wife team, although it's not often preached about. They're not often preached about. It's a hard one to preach. They were a couple in the early Christian church who faced very dire consequences for their deceit and hypocrisy. See, uh, often when we read this story, people's attention go to the fact that they withheld a certain amount of money from the Lord and they assume that God struck them dead because they did not give all that they had to the work of the Lord. But that's not what's going on in the story. The issue was not that they had not given all of their money to the apostles. The issue was that Ananias and Sapphira, they tried to make everyone think that they gave all that they had sold their property for to the work of the Lord, but that was not true. They were lying, they had held part of the money back. So at, as we look at this story, it's important for us to remember first, all of the things that God's been doing in chapters one through the end of four, which is what we've already been preaching on. If you've missed any of the messages, I encourage you to go back and listen so you can stay caught up, so you can continue viewing the whole picture of what's taking place as we move through this series. The, this morning, uh, we're not going to take the time to recount the entirety of those first four chapters, but I do want to mention and review this. The early church here in Acts, they were experiencing a great beginning. Would you not agree? <laughs> Amen. God is moving in our terms that we would say today. God was moving big time, and many were repenting and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many were choosing to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we have read 
so far close to 5,000 men have come to Christ. And those numbers go up drastically when we begin to count in the wives and the children who were not normally counted at that time. As we begin this new chapter, chapter five, it's important to understand this. As people are getting saved, and these were large numbers of people getting saved. Are you with me this morning? 5,000 people in a very short period of time. It's important for us to understand this. The devil does not enjoy watching people come to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive new life. (laughs) He does not enjoy that at all. And he especially does not enjoy watching people thrive after giving their lives to the Lord. Amen. See, it's one thing when we come to Jesus Christ, but then it's another thing as we begin walking with Jesus each and every day, and we begin to learn to apply the word of God to our life, and the Holy Spirit who's inside of us begins to activate that word in our lives, and we begin to thrive from the inside out. Are you with me this morning? See, Satan doesn't enjoy watching those events take place. He initially tried to stop the birthing of of the church. As it began, he initially tried to intimidate it and he brought persecution against it, which continues today. As we're going to note, all of the tactics of the enemy are not, there's nothing new, all right? We know that God is the same today, yesterday, and for always. Listen, Satan is kind of the same in that regard. What tactics he used clear back then are the same type of tactics he uses against us 2,000 years later. Are you with me? He tried to bring persecution to the church. He tried to intimidate them. He tried to get them to be afraid in order to stop these new believers. And when he couldn't stop them by putting pressure on them from the outside, he thought, maybe I can stop them from working from the inside. (laughs) Maybe at least I can be strategic and try to corrupt them one by one. Ananias and Sapphira's issue had nothing to do with an amount of money, all right? But rather, it all came down to this. It was a heart issue. It was a character issue. It was something that began to go wrong inside of them. It was Satan's attempt to try to begin to ruin the church, and and maybe Ananias and Sapphira were his beta test, all right? It was a matter of deadly deception. So let's take a moment this morning And I want us to look at the sin of deadly deception. One of the more troublesome and damaging human tendencies for all of us is our vulnerability to be deceived and also to deceive, all right? We're vulnerable to both as as humans because of our fallen nature, because of our old sin nature. The scripture speaks often of this problem and it would benefit all of us to really pay attention to God's word and to learn as many lessons as possible from this book right here that we call the Bible. Knowing and understanding the word of God is what I call deception protection, all right? It keeps us, it keeps us from being deceived and it keeps us from walking or serving deception towards anyone else. There are several Greek words in the New Testament that are translated as deceive. By far the most common one, though, is this Greek word called planeo, and it means this. It means to go astray, to wander off course, to deviate from the correct path, to roam in error, or to be misled. Just to help us understand something this morning, we, 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 we got to... Get this, we gotta understand that we're all liable of this charge, all of us. We've all been bit by deception and we've all deceived others in our lives. How do you know that, Pastor Tim? Because the Bible is clear in more than one place, but let's go to Isaiah 53 and look at verse six where we read this. All we, say all we. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, him being Jesus Christ, his son, and the Lord has laid on Jesus Christ the iniquity of us all. In the New Testament, we're told that we are all sinners and that we all fall short of the glory of God on our own. In the beginning, deception entered the world when the serpent deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's 
the origin of deception, so to speak. Let's go to Genesis chapter three and look at verses one through five. Now the serpent was more crafty, more deceitful than any other beast of the field and the Lord God, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of any fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. But the serpent said to the woman, hmm, Eve, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you're going to become like him. You're gonna be like God, knowing good from evil. See, from these verses, we wanna learn how Eve was deceived. What were the tactics that Satan used to try to deceive Eve and get her attention off of God's word and on to other things? Number one, the deceiver got Eve questioning God's word. <laughs> Not a new tactic. 2,000 years later, uh, however many thousand from the origin of Eve's sin in the garden, here we are, and he's still trying to get the men and women of God, the children of God, to question God's word. We hear about it all the time. The serpent initiated the conversation by questioning what God had said. In Genesis 3, 1, the serpent asked, did God really say? You must, eat of, you, you must not eat of any tree in the garden? This subtle question was enough to plant a little bit of doubt in Eve's mind regarding the clarity and accuracy of God's word. And this happens all the time in our world today because Satan uses the same old schemes. Number two, the deceiver got Eve mis misrepresenting God in her mind, in her mind. The serpent distorted God's word and, and intentions in her mind, in her thinking. In Genesis 3, four through five, it is told, you will not certainly die. The serpent said that, Eve, you're not gonna die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes are gonna be opened and you're gonna become like God and he doesn't want that to happen. So by making it seem as though God was keeping something beneficial from them, from both her and Adam, the serpent was able to cast doubt on God's good nature. Say good nature. She was able to cast doubt on God's good nature and his honesty and his integrity and who God really was. Number three, the deceiver was really good, really good at appealing to Eve's own personal desires. The serpent targeted Eve's personal desires and her ambitions. He suggested that eating the forbidden fruit would make her like God, would make her wise like God, would make her powerful like God. I don't know if he, I don't know how he knew human nature unless maybe uh, Satan was a falling angel. Maybe there were some similarities. I have no idea. But he cast it out there seeing if she would buy into this. Hey, if you eat of the fruit, you too are gonna be like God, all powerful and all knowing. This appealed to her desire for knowledge and for wisdom. And it made the, for, listen to this, it made the forbidden fruit appear way more attractive than it actually was. Number four, the deceiver then got Eve underestimating the consequences of her actions. The serpent downplayed the consequences of disobedience. He assured Eve that she would not die. You're not gonna die <laughs> as a result of eating the fruit, which contradicted God's warning in Genesis 2-7. Let's read that. God said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The Lord was very clear on what he said. But the enemy, Satan, was very good at getting her to misconstrue the actual words of God. Number five, there was quite possibly some peer pressure that began. Maybe this is where peer pressure began in the earth for the very first time. While it's not explicitly mentioned here in our text, it's possible that the serpent's persuasive words and tactics and arguments could have created this sense of peer pressure between her and Adam 
We know that Adam was with her while she was having this conversation with the serpent in Genesis 3, 6, and he may have been influenced as well by the serpent's arguments. One thing we know for sure is both Eve and Adam ate of the fruit. They both chose to disobey God. In these ways, the serpent deceived Eve by sowing doubt, by subtly misrepresenting God's commands. He appealed to her human desires. He grossly misrepresented the consequences. He quite possibly even exerted peer pressure. And these deceptions ultimately led to Eve's decision to eat the forbidden fruit along with Adam. Their consequences, what were their consequences? Jesus said, when you eat of this fruit, when you even touch this tree, you will surely die. The both of them were cast out of the Garden of Eden. See, God was not talking about a physical death. He was talking about a spiritual death. In the garden, they had full access to God. They had a relationship that you and I could never, uh, we can only dream and imagine possible. One day we will get to experience it when we get to heaven. But they had that heaven-like experience with God 24-7 every day. God provided everything that they needed. He took care of the temperature and the air and the atmosphere. I mean, there was nothing that Adam and Eve needed that God did not provide. But now in spiritual death, they were cast outside of the garden. And then what happened? Well, God began by bringing some curses. He cursed the ground. Now what was given to them freely, they were going to have to work and toil for. Now they're in childbirth. There was going to be pain that the woman was going to have to endure and bear. There's a lot of different curses that took place. These were the consequences of their disobedience to the Lord. Deception can lead us to severe consequences. Not just in our relationship with God, but also with our relationships with each other, with our relationships to our spouses, our children, our friends. There are consequences when we choose to disobey God, consequences between us and God and those around us. There are consequences to sin. Proverbs 12, 19 says, Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Colossians 3, 9 says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with those practices. Deception for all of us will always be very, very convincing at minimizing all the consequences, hiding <laughs> the potency of the consequences that are attached to those things that, to, that appeal to us. Folks, I just want you to know, and you know this, you all know this, the devil is determined to take us all out. You know that, right? For the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We know that the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy. And listen, the truth and the reality of it all is this, he's never going to give up trying to separate us from God. <laughs> and our job is really a simple job, though it's a very difficult job. It's simple, it's hard to do, apart from God's Holy Spirit at work within us. The simple job is this, as children of God, in order to maintain our integrity in relationship with God, we need to do one thing, obey him. We obey him, we obey his word, we obey his commands. We want to obey him, and his Holy Spirit helps us to obey him. And when we disobey him, he brings conviction to turn our hearts immediately back to God in repentance. It's obedience. That's how, how do we handle deception when the enemy brings it our way? We obey God, amen. amen. We obey God. Our job is simply to obey God and not to pursue our own passions. Second Timothy 4 Three through four, I'm gonna ask the worship team to go ahead and make their way back up. Second Timothy four, three through four says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having an itching ear, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, to tell them what they wanna hear. Let's just briefly talk about dangers of an itchy ear. The term itching ear symbolizes a strong desire to only hear what you want to hear and not truth. You're not looking for truth. You're looking to feed 
what you need to feed so that you can do what you wanna do. In today's world, information is readily available. You can go online, you can go get a psychologist or a counselor, which hey, I, I've been to a counselor more than once and there's nothing wrong with that. We need them in our lives. But not if we're looking for answers that are already in the word of God, are you with me? Too many people, when they have a problem, instead of going to God's word and getting on their knees and pray, they call up their friend or they call up whoever it may be and they're trying to win people on their sides to feed and fuel their own ideas and pursuits when God's word really has an answer to everything that we could ever need or want. The danger of itchy ears lies in the fact that we risk replacing God's truth with what we find comfortable and convenient. That's why it's, it's, it's so easy just to go through a drive-thru. It's much easier to go through a drive-thru than go home and, and make your own meal. That's why it's so easy to, when the alarm goes off in the morning, especially as it's getting darker and darker, and especially as it's getting colder and colder, at least here in New England, that's why it's so easy just to stay in bed when the alarm goes off in the morning, because it's comfortable. It's cozy. We like it there where it's warm and we don't have to be uncomfortable. In the old Batman series back in the 60s, maybe 50s, I don't know, I don't remember, uh, but I remember watching it, the reruns, all right, as a kid. And uh, I remember how Batman and Robin in their pursuit of Joker are these different villains. They would be, and they think they're on their trail and they're about ready to grab them and get them and put them, you know, bring them to justice. And all of a sudden they walked into a place where all of a sudden they find that Joker and all of his little misfits, they got them now tied to a wall and they're trapped as this sauce coming right at them, all right? How many have seen those episodes? And, and all of a sudden you hear Robin say, holy, and I can't say the second word, Batman, it's a trap, you know? It's a trap. All of these deceptions, and we're all very, all of us are very familiar with them, <laughs> all of us. They're all traps to try to separate us from God and to separate us from his love and to keep us from his best. It's a trap. Sound teaching cannot be traded for any other thing on the face of the planet. This book needs to be your very best friend. I've done my best to, to, to just encourage all of us to have a physical copy of the Bible because we can control this. It's always at my disposal. The electronic versions can be tampered with. I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying they can. It could be shut down. Uh, if there's no electricity and my device runs out of power, I can't access it. But a physical copy of the Word of God, but even more important than a physical copy or an electronic copy, is the word of God that you choose to learn and know and the, as the Bible says, hide it in your heart, amen? So that we're not deceived. So that we don't fall into Satan's traps. The power of truth over deception. John eight thirty two says, and you will know the truth and the truth will what? Ephesians 4, 15 says, rather speaking the truth in love, we grow up. Look to your neighbor and say, grow up. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Close with this. Over 40 years ago, a husband and his wife, they were mugged on their way from their car to their apartment in Dallas, Texas. And after that traumatic event, the husband is told to have said the following. He said, I never made that short walk again without looking around for potential danger. I often would see women standing near where we were mugged, chatting together without a thought that they may be, without a thought that they may be in a dangerous place. But after we were attacked, I was always alert. I was always on guard. Even to this day, if, if I venture outside into a public place after dark, I keep my eyes open for possible attackers. If you're unaware of potential danger, you're more likely to fall prey to it. So many different directions I could take that. That was so good. But the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira, it should grab our attention. 
it should make us aware. It should keep us looking, not outwardly, but it should get us looking inwardly into our own life, into our own mindset, into the way that we're walking out and living out God's plans and purposes in our lives. It should cause us to stop and take note and ask ourselves, am I being deceived? Am I walking in deception? Am I, is my life in alignment with God? Am I obeying him or am I doing my own thing? See, the reason for their death was not money. It was the sin of hypocrisy. And that lesson should be quite loud. For when we go back to even look at the ministry of Jesus during his three and a half years of ministry, one of his greatest, one of his greatest uh, things that irritated him so much was the hypocrisy of the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the religious people. The case of Ananias and Sapphira illustrates the fact that believers can be led into bold, flagrant sin. And all of us before Christ, we know what sin looks like, smells like, tastes like. And all of us since coming to Christ, we also know what sin looks like, tastes like, and smells like. But Jesus came that we might be freed from sin. If you're with me, say amen. amen. There's no reason for us to remain in our sin. There's no reason for us to stay there. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, if after coming to the grace and the knowledge of the Lord God that we continue to sin, there is no other hope for us. It says that in Hebrews. The sacrifice of Christ, won for us all a victory over sin that we could never have won our own, but we can fully take advantage of. We can fully take advantage of Christ's victory over sin on the cross. You and I can obey God. Say, I can. I can, not on my own, Jim, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, I can obey God. And when I disobey God, I can trust his spirit to quickly correct me and discipline me to bring me back in alignment with him. And in those moments, our job is to repent and to turn back to the Lord. Amen. It was Satan that had filled Ananias and Sapphira's heart to lie in this way. And to really, the Bible said, to test the spirit of the Lord is what they were doing. Hayden Robinson, he was a reverend, a scholar. He, was, he actually uh, was an interim professor at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary at a period of time, but he wrote the following. Would you all stand? He wrote this. When Satan approaches us, he never comes dragging chains, the chains that will enslave us. He comes offering us pleasure, expansiveness, money, popularity, freedom, and joy. In fact, he never even hints about the consequences. He only promises that he'll fulfill the desires of our hearts. And that is precisely how we are destroyed. These altars are open. I don't know what God has spoken to you personally through this message this morning, but I trust that God has spoken loudly and clearly <laughs> to all of us. And these altars are open, and listen, you can stay there and worship God from your seat. You can even turn and kneel and pray at your seat. You can just stand there and pray. You can, you can really do whatever you want, and it doesn't mean that you're far or nearer to the Lord than anyone else. But I do believe that God is really talking to a few people and this message has really hit home for a few people today. This whole thing about deception. Maybe you've been deceived like Adam and Eve. Maybe you've been deceived like Ananias and Sapphira. Or maybe you're the deceiver. <laughs> maybe you've been deceiving the people in your life. I just want to close with the scripture and open the altars and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Joel 2, 12 through 13 says this. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. So rend your hearts and not your garments and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving devotion, and he relents from sending disaster. I wanna invite you to the altar of the Lord this morning. And would you just come to that place of grace 
and let God finish the work that he's doing in your heart right now. If you need to repent, repent. If it's a time for you today to rejoice over the victory that Christ has won for you, rejoice. But just let God finish the work that he's doing in your heart right now so that you can walk out of here with the joy of the Lord in your soul to share with someone around you.